Welcome to the Bite Elect Show, the only programme which gives you all the information you need to know whether you are thinking about Bite Elect for the first time or are an existing investor and landlord. We've already considered Bite Elect as an investment and how to finance and cover your risks, and this show is all about how to choose a property to invest in. Now, the first thing you need to do before you decide what property to buy is to understand who it is you are likely to let to. When most people think about letting a property, they have in mind 20-somethings who can't afford to buy and have to rent instead. However, this isn't necessarily the majority of tenants. Many tenants are waiting for a council house, are students who need temporary accommodation, or people who are working in an area short-term from overseas or in a city during the week and go home to their country Italy at weekends. With our ageing population, we are also seeing a new trend for our older generation to sell their home and rent near family for part of the year and go abroad somewhere warm during our winter months. If you want to be successful at buy to let firstly, you need to be clear what financial returns you want, then understand which type of tenant would best suit your plans. Once you know this, it's about identifying which location those tenants would like to live in and, of course, the type of property they want and can afford. Let's take students, for example. In some areas, university and college students may be happy to walk or travel a mile or more to study, whereas in other areas, the location radius may need to be much smaller, such as half a mile. Buy outside of these areas and you may not be able to let to students at all. The other factor to consider is what's in short supply. For some students, it may be house shares for undergraduates, while in other areas, it may be studios and one-bed apartments for postgraduates, visiting lecturers or overseas students. Unless you understand your financial objectives, match these to a tenant type and then work out what location and property type tenants want in your investment area, you may struggle to secure the returns you'd hoped for. Now, let's go through some examples of this to help explain it in more detail. Firstly, let's consider how to match a tenant type and property to your financial objectives. Let's take, for example, that you want capital growth. Now, typically, a good tenant to deliver this would be a family that wants to rent long term. Most important to them will be the local schools, followed by leisure facilities and good local amenities. They're likely to want two, three bedroomed houses or maybe even an executive five bed property. However, if your financial objective was income, what you could then look at do is look at professional lets or student lets. Now, they are more likely to want a location that's near to their work or to their college or university and probably something that's walkable or indeed they can use public transport. And to make this work, you're probably looking at a property that allows you to let four or five bedrooms. Now, once you have determined the type of tenant and property which will suit your needs, you then need to work out lots more things. For example, what can you actually afford? It might be that you look at buying a new build versus an existing home. You may pay more for the new build initially than you do for the existing home, but remember, you'll save on maintenance costs, certainly for the first five years. Next, do you look at buying a flat or do you buy a house? The issue with a flat from a buy to let perspective is that you have to pay service charges, ground rent, and actually you're relying on a freeholder, another landlord, to make sure that that property is kept in good condition. Next, are you going to renovate for profit and let out a property to boost your returns? And if you're looking at do that, can you cope without any income coming in for some months? Next, instead of actually waiting for income to come in, you could buy a property already let by another landlord so that you get income from day one of purchase. Or you could go to the other extreme, buy a piece of land, build a property to the spec that you want, and then let that out. Now, if you are considering renting rooms, you may even think about renting spare rooms in your own home, as if you do this, you can earn up to £7,500 tax-free income a year. That can go an awful long way to boosting your annual earnings.
I hope that's a useful summary of things you need to do to think through. Next, we'll hear from two experienced landlords, one explaining how they match their investment strategy to tenants and the properties they bought, and the second discussing with a tax expert the pros and cons of investing themselves versus forming a company. Owning a buy-to-let property comes with a lot of challenges and a lot of rewards. So how do you approach it as a full-time business? So this is one of our ensuite rooms. Most of our rooms are now ensuite. We found that's what the market's asking for. Andrew Paris has turned his buy-to-let venture from being a useful source of income into a full-time job. He began six years ago looking for a way to invest his money after the financial crash. As usual, the floor could use a sweep. At least the dishes are done. We wanted to invest in property because we wanted a sound investment with a good return on our capital. The economy was very uncertain, things were happening, it was scary times in investment terms, so property seemed like a very good place to put money because it was bricks and mortar. It's gone so well, Andrew now works full-time in the business. We started off part-time and in that period we built up three properties and we realised that actually it wasn't just an investment strategy, it could be a lifestyle change. So we, we decided to give up our, our day jobs and concentrate on the properties. And uh, over the seven years we've been doing this, we now have 10 properties in Nottingham. That's 62 tenants. From really the beginning, the plan was to offer high quality lets aimed at young, professional people. We always wanted properties that we could walk in and show people and feel comfortable and proud. Our philosophy has been, we've got kids of, of that sort of age, and our philosophy is, is it good enough for our kids? And if it's not, well, why are we expecting somebody else's kids to live there? So we, we'll perhaps go and see a house and we'll look at it, and, and some of them are really cringeworthy, um, in terrible, terrible states. But you can see beyond the surface and think, well, the location's good, the size is good, the structure's basically sound. I can see how we can actually turn this into something that's going to be really attractive and really safe and comfortable for the tenants. With 10 properties and 60 tenants, there's a lot of work to do, but so far there haven't been any major problems. We get most of our tenants through the internet, through the house share websites. Most young people now don't reach a newspaper or magazine, they go online to find things, and that includes their accommodation. Um, sort of tenants we aim for, they're working professionals between the ages of about 23 to 30. Um, nice people, and we have very few problems. There are some issues sometimes because you've got a number of people living in a house and sharing. Um, we try and step in where we have to and just guide people to get it right. Um, but sometimes house share doesn't suit everybody. And unfortunately, we have to say to a tenant, look, you know, at the end of the tenancy, I think it's better to find your own place. But it's few and far between. Most of our tenants are great people. Yeah, I just wanted to show you what I've done in here. So, what's this experienced landlord's advice for others thinking about moving into the buy-to-let market? I think if you're setting out to be a landlord, do your research. There's a lot of things like gas safety, electrical safety, um, market demand. It's too easy to watch TV programmes and think, oh, that's easy, and it's not. Nottingham in particular has a lot of rules and regulations surrounding um, all landlords, but particularly multiple occupancy, like we do. Um, and you can actually fall foul of all sorts of laws, regulations, and be in serious trouble if you don't get it right. So how do you turn your buy-to-let into a full-time business and is it a good idea to set up your own company or buy as an individual? Hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you Thank too. You. Property you. owner Emsel Ahmet is meeting Michael Wright from Rita for Rent to discuss the pros and cons. Uh, so it looks like, yes, yeah, probably 15 to 18 properties here. Do you have ideas roughly of perhaps the percentage profits that you make? Do you know the profits that do come in. I spend all of it back into refurbishing the properties, mm. so I can't actually live off the portfolio. So tell me a little bit about what you're, you're looking at doing in maybe the next five years, the next ten years, and yeah. then we could perhaps build a plan. I started off going to Scotland, invested there, um, but then 
after a couple of years, I found that the capital growth wasn't there. Um, so I borrowed more money and I started investing in London. Well, I've taken a year to step back and not do anything and just look at perhaps what's happening and what the future could hold. Um, and I've decided that it would probably be wiser to incorporate, so I'm taking advice on that. So you've, you've given us this excellent summary of... For Michael, yeah. there are many factors to consider before deciding whether to set up a company. The attraction with limited companies is if you're a higher rate taxpayer, you would pay 20% corporation tax as opposed to 40% tax um, if it was income tax and held individually. But it's a big decision to make because it's not just the, the corporation tax versus income tax, which is uh, the case in point. Um, whilst you pay that lower rate of tax as a company, you still may want to extract those profits out of the company. So if you're an investor, that, for instance, that holds property individually, they pay the tax and they've got that money left over in their pocket. If they've got it in a company, the profits are taxed, but then you've then got further implications of taking it out. So you may pay yourself a salary, you may pay yourself a dividend. Um, these can attract further tax implications. So it's a bit of a balancing act to try and work out what the best way is to do it. Um, and what we say is to make the right decisions for the right reasons. Don't just go straight into the, the, the thought process that I've got going to company because it's a lower tax rate, it, it's taking a step back, um, trying to see what you're trying to achieve in the future and then map your way to achieve that in the most efficient way. It's clearly a big decision and one that you have to think through carefully and the message from those who've done it, take advice. Speak to an accountant that deals with property um, and get some in-depth advice before stepping out and buying a property for rental purposes. You could find that you're paying a lot more tax than you expected. Next we'll be talking about how to choose the right area and property to let with our panel of experts. On the Buy to Let show we've been talking about how you choose the right property to let. Joining me now to talk about that more are Carrie Allison from Hunter's Agents, Christina Dimitrov from Direct Line, and Vanessa Warwick from Property Drives. Hello, everybody. So, my first question, Carrie, perhaps you can kick us off. Given a choice, should investors be looking at a flat or a house? Um, I think you, as an investor, you want to look at what's going to, to, to give you the best return. Uh, so to, when you're considering a flat, maybe you really need to consider the leasehold aspect of it. Um, you know, you need to pay your ground rent and service charges. So that has a, an additional impact on, on, out, on your outgoings. Um, but also looking at things like the age and condition of the property is also really important. So house or flat also comes out down to the area. If it's city centre, it's going to be a flat, definitely. Yeah. So looking at your market, you need to look at all those aspects from your area to the type to what the outgoings are going to be. OK, that's helpful. Christina, from a, an insurance perspective, is there a big difference? Well, from an insurance perspective, if you want to keep things simple, very transparent, it's easier to buy a house, definitely. And why is um, a flat more complex? Well, because typically your freeholder, the person that owns or the company that owns the entire building, will have some sort of buildings insurance and you are contributing to it via your service charge. What it means, however, is that if you're letting out this property, it may not be covered. This, this service charge insurance may not cover for a tenant being in the property or for public liability, for example, that you also need as a landlord. So you'll have to do quite a lot of extra research. You have to get an idea of what the insurance contract looks like. And then you have to get separate insurance for yourself that covers any eventual gap. So it just really is a little more work. It's a little more complex. Sure. And at the point of a claim, you might just have to ring a few more phones. OK. And Vanessa, hugely experienced landlord, tell us your view. 
I am a big fan of freehold houses. Um, I mean, obviously there is the issue of leasehold. It restricts what you can do to the property. With a freehold house, you can add value. You could do a, you know, a loft conversion. You could do an extension. You have much more control over the property. And um, you know, I believe that actually uh, houses are in decline. There's a huge trend towards building leasehold flats. Um, and wherever there's scarcity, there's value. And you know, families want to live in houses. They want a garden that their kids can play in. You know, they want good parking. They want to be in a good school catchment area. And they want to be in a kind of community. And, and for me, it's freehold houses all the way. Right, there we go. And um, my next question is, is Back to you as well, Vanessa. We, we chat about this a lot. <laughs> uh, if you go online or you're going to a show, how many times do we see people offering discounted properties, instant income through rent to rent? What's your kind of thoughts on these initiatives? Do they actually work or what research do you have to do? Well, due diligence is absolutely key in really anything is. to do with property, not only on the actual property the, itself, but every single person or entity you're going to have any kind of financial interaction with. Um, you know, my, my sort of bottom line on this is if it sounds too good to be true, it is every time, without fail, no exceptions. And um, the other thing is, it's don't take anybody's word for anything. Always do your own research. And the biggest thing for me is to find the demand before you create the supply. It's no good buying a property that you allegedly got a 10% discount off if nobody wants to rent it. Of so course. you've got to find the demand first. Yeah. Um, and there's so many, uh, I call them wealth creation companies or get rich quick schemes out there that make so many promises. And you know, I call it buying a ticket to see a unicorn because what they offer, you know, the vast majority of the time is very, very hard to bring to reality. Sounds great in theory, go and put it into practice and you'll find blockages all the way. So, so important to do your own due diligence, get the right advice and support um, and make sure that you understand your investment from every angle. If you don't, it won't be an investment, it will be an absolute financial uh, you know, nightmare. And this isn't quite the armchair investment that it is. You're right, you've got to get out of that armchair, visit and visit that property. I mean, some people buy without even visiting the property, don't they? Absolutely astonishing. When a new mobile phone comes out, people will travel and go, you know, at five o'clock in the morning to queue up and then they're going to invest in a property and they, they don't even bother to go and see it. I find it absolutely astonishing. It's absolutely vital to go to the area, understand it, seek the input of local lettings agents get their views on things um, and, and just fully understand it. Okay, that's really helpful. And I guess that really brings us on to the last question. Um, Christina, who, who do you think are the key people that a landlord has to work with to make sure that their buy-to-let is successful? So I think, uh, I think there are generally three steps you can think about. First of all, you need to get an idea of what the realistic rental income is that you can expect in that area. And to get that, you need to really speak to somebody who's a local agent who understands the recent trends, the recent growth, what's driving rental levels in a certain area, and what you can then realistically expect. Mm -hmm. So you can't. They can change quite quickly, can't they? they? Can From change. doing quite well to not doing so well. Exactly. It can go in both directions. It could be that there is some major development that you know increases supply in an area. It could be that there's a new built road awesome. that changes you know the history of this whole area. So there can be a lot of things that implement impact that, and an agent really will know about this. But he needs to be very very local. So it's not like you're going to be in London and you're going to go all the way to Soho to get a check for a property in Bethnal Green. Yeah. Yeah. You need to stay in the place that you want Talking to invest in. Knowing those roads and streets. Yes, exactly. And the other thing, of course, then is you need to, like Vanessa said, have a look and inspect the building. You need to be aware if there's any problems with the building structure or if in this area there's been incidents subsidence for example because this is something that can really cause you a lot of trouble mm -hmm. so what you need is somebody who's a surveyor again ideally somebody locally based yeah. who knows, knows knows the ground who knows the ground who knows the history who's spoken to other people in this area and finally when you want to buy and you go to that step you need to speak to a lawyer 
somebody who can guide you through this process and can, I suppose, save you not only from hassle, but also from problems that you wouldn't have thought about. He can guide you through that process. Mm. And again, let me get back to this. Local is really good. Mm. So local people will A, know other landlords that have potentially the same properties. They will know a lot about changes to the area, for example, flight paths. They'll know if there's some planning permission for other major properties. They will be the ones that can guide you for any eventualities. Okay, yeah, I think that's really helpful. Mm. Carrie, you're an agent, so I yes. guess that's top of the list. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it's absolutely right. It is about local expertise. That's what a good agent is all about. That's what, that's what they thrive on as well. Um, it's about knowing the, the area. To give the to give the landlord some proper information, whether that's serious information about the property itself or what's local that's going to be appealing to people who want to rent there, it's all about that knowledge of being a local expert, um, which I think is is so so important. Because you can get in some areas where we're talking about houses and schools and things, where one side of the street goes to one school and the other side of the street mm -hmm. goes to another, and that can actually even affect house prices. It can, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 coming back around in terms of the, the, the type of tenants that you're going to appeal to, you know, you, when, when you're, as an agent, you want to appeal to the most amount of people. Um, and as a landlord, that's, so, that's key, key for you to get, to get someone in there to start getting a return on your investment. And I guess as managing tenants all the time, then you understand what the changes are in supply and demand. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Uh, we talk to our tenants all the time. We get their feedback. You know, they talk to us. That you know, they then come to us for advice when they want to move on. So it's full circle, um, and that's why having a, a local expert is is really really important. And also, I think with agents, important to know they're not regulated. Um, so it's uh, an agent that's Arla, Nals, Ricks, or UK Arla, I think is the other one, yeah. and making sure they're a member of a good trade organisation that keeps them up to date with the legals. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the uh, benefit biggest benefit for landlord and tenants you know it's important that that people know that it's a voluntary accreditation that agents like us have um, and that does show people that the property is going to be safe well looked after going to meet all the regulations yeah, it's absolutely absolutely essential okay that's great well thanks very much so that's it for now on the Buy to Let show. Many thanks to my guests for being with me. And don't forget, you can see all of our programmes online where you'll find everything you need to know about Buy to Let. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now. Here on the Buy to Let show, we aim to bring you all the information you need to run a successful Buy to Let. You can find more advice and help by following these links. And you can download our special ebook, which goes with the programme.